Good evening. I'm Stephen Bartkiss, the curator of the Gun Historical Museum in Washington, Damn. Connecticut. It's Tuesday, May 10th, 2022, and we thank you for joining us for this Zoom meeting of the Gun Museum's Washington History Club at night. For those of you who are new to the History Club meetings, these are not lectures, but rather a group discussion about an hour long where we'll all informally discuss the history of Washington Green, Washington Depot, Marbledale, New Preston, and Woodville. We encourage you to share your stories and memories with the group, or if you prefer, you can just listen to the fascinating conversation about our town's past. We also encourage you to show your related photos and objects to the group. The topic of tonight's meeting is Merchants of Washington Then and Now. During this meeting, which is being recorded we, and will be posted on the museum's YouTube channel and archived at the museum, your video and audio settings will remain on, but we please ask that you keep yourself muted to minimize the background noise. And when you'd like to join the conversation, you can unmute yourself to talk. It's important that only one person speak at a time so everyone could hear what's being discussed. And uh, also note on the top right of your screen, there's a button that allows you to switch between gallery view and speaker view so you can see everyone else in this meeting. Please note that the museum's next guest lecture is how the Lake Waramog Task Force brought the lake back from the brink with Sean Hayden of the Lake Waramog Task Force on Zoom this coming Monday, May 16th at 6.30. Please mark your calendars and register for this and our other upcoming programs on the Gun Museum's website. Our moderator for this evening is Dmitry Rimsky. He grew up in Washington and attended Washington Elementary and High School. Over the years, he has been involved in many town activities okay. and organizations. In addition to oh, serving on the COVID-19 okay. Response Committee, he is currently a member of both the Planning Commission and the Historic District Commission. He works as a house painter and is an occasional poet. Now I'll hand the program over to Dimitri. Okay, hello folks. Uh, <clears throat> we're gonna try and make this a discussion. And the problem with the discussion is that uh, everybody wants to talk at once. I'm gonna try and give us some guidelines so that we can actually have a nice conversation about uh, the merchants in town. Uh, I'm going to only reiterate this once, and that is that if you don't want to say anything, mute yourself so that your dog or your children or some other event doesn't uh, overcast the people speaking. So, uh, but I do encourage you to join in. I can't possibly keep you entered. Well, I could actually entertain you for an hour, but I would rather not. I'd rather hear your stories and uh, and remembrances or any information you have about the merchants in okay. town. Uh, one of the, um, uh, uh, we'll start with something very simple. There was a picture posted of this, uh, of Randy Johnson and a number of the people working at his store. Does anybody, did anybody work for Randy or does anybody have any direct memories of Randy's store or the history of it? <clears throat> Anyone? Jim. Jimmy, could that, that person, that unidentified individual be uh, Georgia Servi, or is that too early? I really don't know. That's why I'm asking who these people were. Uh, 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 Dim Dimitri, it's Bill. How are you? Yeah, hi, and Bill. My brother John worked for Randy for like two years when he was going to Waterbury at UConn, and the butcher what? at that time was a guy, Julie Honorado, who also sold shoes on the side out of the butcher's thing. But I'm not, that looks a little younger than Julie, so I'm not sure that that's him. Um, Demetrius is uh, Bruce yeah. Adams. How are you? Hey, Bruce. Uh, I, I worked for Randy for a couple of years, actually. Um, and uh, I think that that is Juliana Rado. I'm not positive. Um, I, I got to know him a bit working there. And my brother and I got to know him even more when Randy called us and asked us to come in and help with the inventory in the store every, every uh, New Year's Day. And uh, we found out in doing that that Julie had a little uh, uh, nip of spirits behind the uh, butcher counter, which uh, uh, kept, kept the uh, spirits high during a rather boring uh, uh, inventory, which we did, I think, two or three times, my brother and I. 
Well, that may explain a number of things. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, just, just so that some of you who aren't familiar with Randy Store, um, Randy Store started off as, I believe, an AMP uh, that was located right on the road uh, where Marty's is now. And during the flood, uh, I believe Mike Condon had just come over from Ireland to work at the store. And he was living on the second floor when the flood came through. Uh, and uh, he, was, uh, he stood in the balcony and watched the rest of the town get flooded. Um, of course, after the flood, the, the store had to be rebuilt as many of the merchants in town were given commercial spaces to replace the flood damage spaces. And that's when the brick building, uh, the two brick buildings that are uh, where Marty's is and uh, whatever is over on the other side, those two buildings were built to replace the flood damaged commercial properties. And Randy's store occupied the entire first floor of that uh, brick building where Marty's is now. Uh, and um, I'm trying to remember, uh, maybe there's somebody old enough here on the, uh, I remember there were two terms. One was the big store and one was the market. And, and I'm not sure whether the big store referred to Randy's and the market only referred to the Washington food market. No, the big store was, that? was the Washington food market and Randy's was Randy's. Yeah, that's the other thing. So what was, who who remembers going over town to the big store? Well, the big Anybody? store, the big store, Jimmy, was always referred to as Red's when Red yeah. D'Antorio owned oh, it. Right. And it, was, and it was just two aisles. And then to Bruce's point, Randy's was always Randy's. Yeah, okay. That helped me because I just remember as a kid, we would go over town to the big store or to the market because that's where we'd get candy and stuff during lunch hour when we're supposed to be having lunch. <laughs> um, and uh, while, while we're at that, uh, you're right, Red Divitorio, yeah. right? Yeah. And, the, and the Lucinas, right? Lucinas, Lucinas? Lucina, Lucina. Lucina. Uh, they owned the big store or, ran, or uh, the market before the um, Verastos took it over. They did. Uh, Dimitri? Yeah. I mean, this is Arch, this is Arch, this is Arch Williamson. Hey, before, Arch. Before uh, Red and Gene owned it, it was owned by Tony DeNova. The big uh -huh. store was. Did you did you know them? Your pardon? Did you know them? Yeah. They had, a son, they had a son named D, D DeNova. Uh huh. I think he was about the same age as the Stouffer boys. Uh huh. Because that's the oldest, I think that's the oldest continuous uh, commercial enterprise in town, as far as I can tell. And that goes back to when it was the Baker Brinsmaid and uh, the, uh, that building was there at the very beginning of, of uh, the center of town uh, or Factory Hollow as they were well, referred all the, to. That's where all the buildings based on the street there. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I can remember when the entrance to uh, the market was on um, Main Street or River Road, right. depending on how you think of it. Harry, Ga Harry Gage's business was down at the end of the building, and then they had uh, DeNova, and then they had uh, a meat locker was at the end of the building. Uh -huh. Right. <laughs> Is anybody, anybody on here work on... Uh, uh, work at the worked at the mark either one of those markets other than uh, Bill Fairburn's brother and uh, Bruce's. Uh, yeah, I did too. Yeah. Yeah. You worked at the market. I worked at uh, no. I worked for Randy for a couple yeah, of years. Yeah. Yeah. I I spent thirty five years with the Verastros. Uh, started with Gene. Yeah. Uh, very happy. Very all good experiences. Yeah, the, uh, I got to I got to put a plug in here for Jim, our first selectman. Um, um, this is in your honor, Jim. Um, when Jim was running for first selectman, uh, he was still the butcher at the at the market, and there were signs around town saying, "Vote for the other guy, save the butcher." <laughs> <laughs> But you're doing a good job, Jim. So, and, and the new butcher seems to be holding up well, too. So, 
Thanks, we're Jim. happy for that. Thanks. <laughs> Dimitri. Yeah. Brendan, how you doing? Good, Brendan. Good. I'm going to take uh, you and the rest of the crew on a little voyage from uh, my childhood, uh, which would be down Baldwin Hill Road from uh, Fulwa Road, which is our Fulwa's <laughs> Road, whatever you, however you want to uh, uh, pronounce it. So the, the first business that I would encounter would be Dr. John C. Wolf's Dentistry. Oh, yeah. Just past uh, Calhoun Street. Yeah. Uh, he was my dentist, and I unfortunately frequent him, frequented that business many, many times. My little story about that is I had such rotten teeth that he would almost every time I'd go there want to pull one, but he had these unbelievably dull needles. <laughs> And I said, I don't want Novocaine. And he uh, would put me in the chair and he'd have this foot long needle that he tried to give me. I said, I don't want it. And then he'd bring his wife, Eleanor in and she would hold me down while he took a pair of, uh, I thought they were like uh, pliers and yank out my, uh, my teeth. It was, let's just say it was heaven. So <laughs> I remember Dr. Road, Wolf. Though, I just wanted so we're not spending, but further down the road uh, would be Clay Park's nursery, which she went up on top of the hill where uh, his, he was the son of um, mm -hmm. Park's drugstore. But that was, um, you know, that was a successful nursery many, for many years. And, and Brendan, I think it was called Hickory Hill. Yeah, I think that's right. Hickory yeah. Hill. Yep. And then at the corner of, uh, Baldwin, or I mean Route 109 and, uh, and Calhoun was a business that was run by a guy by the name of Joe Von Arbor. And he was a, uh, he did small motor repairs. And I remember going there with my father to have things rewound, a, a motor rewound. Uh, and he was in the basement of what is Lazar's uh, architecture business oh, now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Just down the road from him on the one building down was Bob Bronson. He owned an appliance uh, sales and repair. Um, and then if you're back out on Calhoun and you go down Calhoun, on the right-hand side was Bob Puzar's business. It's a little dilapidated building now, but that was the beginning of Sh uh, Shiver Mountain Press. And that right. was Bobby Puzar's um, a business that he ran by himself, as far as I remember. And then Brandon, I Brandon, Brandon what? Did did the Arn Glance take over that business yeah, from that yeah, location? There was, there was a changeover. I think that my I don't I'm not gonna say yes to that, but I know um I I just remember as a kid that Bobby Puzar was yeah because yeah. I remember Dimitri. Yeah, Terry. Originally that originally that business was owned by the Hamburgers up on uh, uh Churchill Road. You're right. And, Bo and Bobby Bobby worked for them for years and then he took it over when they moved. That's right. I remember the hamburgers uh, were the ones who really started it, aren't they? Yeah. Hey, Archie, your brain's still good. Brendan, you on my voyage down here. So the next driveway on the left past Puzar's is Bruno Ranieri's driveway, which is long, but Bruno had an unbelievable landscaping and mon, uh, lawn mowing business. And he was instrumental when I bought our property in helping me figure out what to do. And it was just, he was a great, great person. Hey. Hey, turn off your music. Just like me. Thank you for that uh, musical interlude, JK. Um, we weren't really appreciative of it, but it's a lovely song for another time. Uh, so, Dim Dimitri, may I just, I just want to finish. So going down yeah. the hill, there was Ines, I think it was Ines Pickett. She owned a boarding house, which was between the phone company and the supply company. Right. And it was a two or three story house up sitting up on the hill. It's not there anymore. Uh, but that was on the next to the supply. And the next building down in, when I was young in around 1960, there was a gas station that's a supply company uh, operated. And I believe it had to have been an, it wouldn't have been a Mobile, maybe an Exxon, but Russ Wheeler from Roxbury at the time must have been 16 or 17 and he was working there. I remember one Saturday walking down there all by myself 
And I looked up and who do I see but Marilyn Monroe and Arthur Miller going into the supply company. And I thought, I need to tell somebody this. So I went over and told uh, Russ. And of course, he, he beat feet to see if he could <laughs> see uh, uh, Marilyn. But, um, but I, I'll leave it there. I, there are other places that I frequent in and got in trouble in and all that good stuff. So somebody else can carry on. Brandon, uh, Bruce Adams, back hey, up the hill, back up the hill, uh, yeah. across from Lazar's, what's Lazar's now. I remember the, the Bruins family lived across the yeah. way there. Anything right. go on in, in those buildings over there? Well, that was where Arnold and Chris and Sandy. Yeah, and exactly. Uh, Chris was in my class in school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he he, he worked for Tom Rossford down uh, and Tom's shop was down where uh, Reese Owens in that same building, um, you know, in Titus Park. Okay. Titus Park now. Uh, while we, well, I don't know. I thought I saw somebody from the. Uh, I thought mm -hmm. I saw somebody from the supply, but mm -hmm. while since you since you were going on hey, tour, hey. yeah. Oh, there you are. John and, and Vincent, how are you? Excellent. I'm glad you're here. So I just wanted to mention that the supply company is as is not quite as old as the Baker Brins made uh commercial building but uh it's certainly as old uh, it's almost as old i don't know maybe stephen has the date somewhere we're 130 but, next year 130 is next, that, did you, next year i am <laughs> <laughs> okay hey, uh, but we have a picture that we'd like to share that sure go ahead this is actually hanging in the supply for many behind years. jay's desk and uh -huh. uh, May answer. There was a conversation on Facebook last week, and you were questioning a building that was next to Vinny's Texaco. And that's actually right. a photo. This is an aerial shot. Mm -hmm. We're going to do our best to try to hold it up and scan it. And tell us, Dimitri, if we're like you need to move to the left or right. Okay. I'm going to try to hold it. It's a big poster. So, yeah, it's big. Um, we can go in closer. We'll, we'll go up and try to center on the supply. Oh, yeah. It's the 1950 aerial view. No, or it was fifty. Go it was here. right before the flood. Right. If you could tell us whether to move it up or down, I'm trying to get to that. Which one? Did, now, do you see the supply there? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So if I go up, you might see that building that was next to Vinny's. Yes. It's kind of uh, like where the old phone booth used to be. Uh huh. Okay, I can Are you see seeing it. That? Can I point to that? Let me see if I can point to it. I think it's right, right up here. Here. Yeah. So that's like yeah. right across the uh from where B Brook comes out now. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that was uh, I think Archie uh had uh can you keep that up for a second? Sure. I think Archie had identified uh, a couple of businesses that were in there at one point in the in the thread on Facebook that you're talking about. But okay. while you have, can you just hold it up there for a second? I just want to point out that this is just pre-flood, okay? And that building had a, no had a number of businesses in it. And it also had, um, I'm trying to find, uh, anyway, that business, the, the, uh, there was also next to the right angles to that business was the, uh, was it Valley Hardware Store, I believe? Oh, that's... Uh... Yeah, that was this white building next to the liquor store. Right, that was Valley Hardware. And then the gas station was in that little corner. Okay. So, uh, and the low, little low flat building is was Meeker's Electric at one time. And oh. then... Uh, and then it's now uh, the, the 27 Janes or whatever it's called. I don't... <laughs> Uh, I don't remember the name of the store. Five jeans. Five jeans. Okay. And then the interesting thing is, if you look at that picture of the supply, you see a lot of the buildings are the same, except that the coal towers and yes. the oil tanks in the back. And as you were, as Brendan was pointing out, the supply company had not only a gas station, but they also supplied oil for your furnaces and they had coal for both the trains and people's homes. Uh, and the train tracks went right up past that so that they could get coal into their, uh, into the trains from there. If we, if we shift it over to, I'm gonna have it on back up. Thank you. Yep. 
if I get this corner here. Oh yeah, there's kind of Randy's where original the, store. Where the Randy's market was. And I, yep. I got a question on that. Was that called the Chapog market? I think that was called the Chapog market after it was the AMP, but I'm not sure. Anybody else know that? It was That's Bader's, my understanding, Dimmy. It was Bader's market originally. No, no, I, Bader's was on River Road. Are you talking Bader's about market, Bader's market? Uh, my was that true? My parents lived above uh, Bader's Market when they were first uh, married, but it, it wasn't across the. No, Bader's. I think Bader's was right on River okay. Road, right against the river. So which market Bader's are you was... talking about? Bader's. Bader's was directly opposite of the liquor store on the riverbank. Yep. Okay. But how about the other market that was up the road? Uh, I think it's at the corner, of the intersection of uh, Titus. Harry Swanberg's place. Well, the, it, it, this is Bill Fairburn. If you, if you, if if you know where the Hickory Stick Building is, and then next to it was Hull's Blacksmith, and the place next to it where it's now, I think Dick Carey's family owned that they rented out. That was Schmadel's store. All right. And and, and Schmadel's, you know, that was like a little grocery store too. That, where Bill, is that the one uh, that Harry Swanberg ran? I, I, yeah, I'm not sure, but I, I remember Nick Rimbaki worked there. I remember Nick telling me when he was a kid that he worked at Schmadel's. And then Kenya Green, who I went to work for when I came back from law school, had a contract to buy that. And they were going to turn that into the Upson Secor, you know, the Waterbury office he was in. And it got destroyed in the flood. I, I remember that was the story he told me. I was, before we get any further, I think. We, we, I wanted to make sure we covered some of the really, um, you know, people, the, 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 the businesses that we all know knew existed and no longer exist. And those two of those businesses that I think are important to make sure we, we note are the two pharmacies that we had, both parks, of course, with the lunch counter and the green drugstore. Yeah. Uh, and the green drugstore was uh, run by, um, uh, Van Gaal, Irving Van Gaal, <clears throat> pardon, Irving Van Gaal, Irving, absolutely. Bill, Bill was a soda fountain jerk for that establishment. I, I, I put two good years in at the the, the Green Drug <laughs> Store, uh, from nineteen September of nineteen sixty five till September of nineteen sixty seven when I went off to college. Oh wait a minute, Bill. That means you waited on me when I was a student at Gunnery. Yes, yes, I did. And you were a pretty shitty tipper, pal. <laughs> the, the other thing, which is really great that, that I just realized is Archie Williamson came back from the Navy Arch and he worked at the drugstore with me for a few months before he headed out somewhere. Was that right, Arch? Archie's on uh, mute. Oh, he's on mute, yeah. But but that, that uh, Archie sort of showed me, Mr. Von Gaal, you, you always had to be in motion, perpetual motion, even if there was nothing to do. Now, there was Bill, nobody. Bill, my it. recollection was that Mr. Von Gaal, as as they could legally do in those days, also sold liquor there. Uh, absolutely. Were right. you trusted with that, Bill? No, we no we we could not sell liquor or cigarettes because we were only sixteen, seventeen. Ah, okay. But he did entrust me with. Down in the basement, there was a corner that had chicken wire with some flimsy door and a lock on it. And he did trust me to organize all the liquor, you know? So I, that, that made me feel like, you know, I'm really doing good. Let, let me just, I, I, I could take up the whole thing, but let me just tell one funny story about the drugstore. So, oh, two. One was we had this old Ford Falcon station wagon. So I used to do all the deliveries in that. And I was coming down the green hill one day and all of a sudden there's this tremendous smash crash grinding metal and the engine stops and I'm going, Jesus, you know? So I coast down the hill. I don't know what that is. I get into the depot and Eddie Varley comes over and says, the gas tank fell out, you know? And I thought, <laughs> I'm going to get fired. But so that was funny. But the other one was <laughs> Mrs. Hammond lived at the rocks. And I used to deliver. Someone needs to, to mute their thing. Mrs. Hammond used to get the massive deliveries of Poland Springs water. And it came in big green bottles. And I, I couldn't figure out what it was. So I asked Mr. Van Gaal, 
and he said she bathes it. So one of the deliveries, I went over to the service entrance and I knock on the door and there's no answer. And I say green, you know, green drugstore. And I hear this voice upstairs, oh, bring it on up. And I'm thinking she's in the bathtub and she wants me to bring the water up. I'm out of here. So I went back and I told Mr. Von Gaal, you know, if you want to fire me, but I'm not taking the water upstairs to her bathroom. So, you know, but there's millions of stories like that. Well, Bill, who were your coworkers at the drugstore? Well, I started out with Fastback, Bill Dills. Yeah, oh, Bill Dills, sure. And then- he drove um, a hearse Bell for a while, didn't he? Yeah, he had the hearse, right. Yeah. And that was a funny thing because the house I'm living in was the Bellinger's house. And Aunt Lou, called, we all called her Aunt Lou, Kim Bellinger lived here. And so I was over here a lot and, you know, Bill Dills and everybody. So Shorty Hearn would come over too. So Bill, Bill Dills would come over in the hearse and Shorty Hearn would come over in the Morning Glory flower shop band. <laughs> and so one night Aunt Lou said, look, I can only have one of you here at the, each time because people see a hearse and a flower thing and they think someone died. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Well, I wanted to bring up something uh, and I wanted to move on. I mean, the stories about Irv and the, and the green drugstore could probably go on all night. Maybe we should do separate stories on each one of these places. But the other story I wanted to, is that Parks Drugstore uh, and then uh, other than Clayton Parks, of course, was the uh, druggist for many, many years. And, uh, and then uh, the Hussies, uh, Dennis took over. Uh, but for years, of course, there was a lunch counter there. And the lunch counter at Parks Drugstore was just the center of town of all information. And I'll tell you one odd thing about the drugstore lunch counter. And that is that along the entire length of the lunch counter against the wall was a mirror. And people would sit at the counter and be able to talk to each other at one end of the counter to the other through the mirror. And everybody knew who they were talking to. So if you wanted to talk to somebody at the end of the counter, you would go, oh, by the way, how are the kids? And they would answer, they're fine. So-and-so broke his leg. And then the people next to you would be talking to somebody else in the mirror. Everybody knew who they were talking to. And uh, it, was, it was a very unusual experience. And the other thing is that you'd mentioned Ina. Somebody mentioned Ina, I think uh, Brendan did. Ina was the queen of the drugstore counter. I mean, she ran that place with an iron yeah, fist. Sure. Uh, I don't know if anybody here worked at the drugstore during those years. Anybody worked at the lunch counter? Dimitri? Yeah. I did. I actually, uh, my uh, companion in trouble was Michael Belfonte. Uh, and Michael Belfonte um, had some kind of an inn, and we would uh, initially we'd go down in the basement and we'd take and mix all of the soda that came in, like a Coca-Cola or a Pepsi would come in this huge uh, two or three gallon container and you had to mix that, that additive with sugar and whatever else to get whatever they needed up on the, up where, um, it was Ina and Lily in Richmond were the two That's right. uh, people yeah. who served. But eventually I actually turned into being the person who uh, at four o'clock in the afternoon uh, would open, uh, would, would work behind the bar. The sandwich bar was closed. I don't know if that closed at two o'clock in the afternoon. There was no chance of getting a sandwich, but you could get you know anything with ice cream and any of the pre-made stuff. But I worked there for a good number of years um, when, when Dennis owned it, and um, I learned a lot. Brandon, <laughs> wasn't, wasn't I, uh, Ina the sister of Mrs. Yeah. Bruins? Yeah, 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 exactly, Bruce, she yeah. was. Uh, and, she, and she controlled that lunch counter. Yeah, I, I would say that's an understatement. Yeah. Yeah. Eric? Dimitri, yeah. um, I, I remember Ina and Lillian, and I remember going to the lunch counter when my father ran the bookstore, and sitting down and trying, being a wise ass, trying to order sandwiches that were not offered. <laughs> you know, it wasn't ham, egg, and onion, and everything else that was there. And she always gave me very curt answers. Um, and, you know, that didn't deter me. I kept on going. But she ruled that counter. And I used to get into it with her about, she's from Scotland. So I used to say, yeah, Scotland, England, what's the difference? 
Wow. <laughs> she almost came over the counter at me. But um, it was an experience. Great. They were wonderful. And, you know, Ina was Ina. Yeah. Bruce. Uh, yeah, I think uh, Bruce I Arnold's think wife. Bruce Arnold's wife's name was B, or the nickname was B. I don't remember her. Yes. Yeah. No, I remember, I remember her and him. Yeah. I think one of the things that that is, I, I don't know how to describe this, but when you live in a small town, you know every single merchant and they know you. And there's something about that that is is just a rare thing for a child growing up and then becoming an adult in the community. You're always a person of, of presence to any of these uh, merchants because they know you, they know who your family is. And uh, that's not a common experience anymore. And for us, and that's why this conversation is so amusing, is because we all have these incredible stories of our encounters with these, with these people who ran the businesses in town. Um, one thing that I just want to point out is that uh, it used to be on Wednesday afternoon, everything closed. Yeah. Does anybody remember that? Yep. Yeah. I don't know what that was, but Wednesday afternoon, the whole center of town closed down. Except for the liquor store. I, uh, Swanee. Oh, yeah. yay, Swanee. <laughs> Let's hear it for Swanee. Thank you. No, the drugstore. Drug store was, was one of my last ones. Okay. That was my only day off from the green drugstore. I worked six days a week, and then, you know, we school got out at two thirty, so I didn't have to work on Wednesday. And <laughs> usually, I go to school that day either. I took the whole day off. <laughs> well done, Park, Bill. Park Drug, uh, Dimitri Parks Drug, uh, continued that longer than the rest of them. I remember, you know, mid seventies, they still closed at one o'clock on Wednesdays, where the yep. stores would stay open. So getting back to uh, the small town camaraderie, Dimitri, and the fact that um, how many places still have house accounts and, you know, I mean, parks did and the food market and the liquor store, and I'm sure all the places, you know, far before I was working for the supply company and we're still, you know, keeping up with our, uh, and people come in now to this day and I'll ask them if they have a house account and they, they don't understand what that means. I'm like, well, do you get a bill from us every month? They're like, no. <laughs> like, would you like one? <laughs> you <know>? so, <laughs> and um, so it's, just, yeah, it's, it's kind of a special little thing Dawn, that don't hear about anymore. Yeah. How long have, how long have you, has the garden center been a, a separate part of the supply? Um, so it became employee owned and, um, so I've been there 18 years this year. Wow. And yeah. So, uh, Valerie and Jay and Bob Whalen and Tom all bought it. I want to say about 15 years ago and about 15 years ago. And then Bob Whalen, who was part of that five, uh, saw a vision about putting a lawn and garden in, into that building and taking the kitchens out and putting the contractors next door. So um, I want to say it was about 16 years ago. Well, it was yeah. a great idea, I have to say. Yeah, it was um, a smart, it's a really smart move on their part. Yeah, it really was. And um, so uh, does anybody have anything about any of the other stores? Jim raises his hand. Jimmy, uh, it was mentioned before about Ed Meeker and, and his shop. Does anyone recall when Ed Meeker's shop was the protocile of the current Washington food market? And yeah. <laughs> I, I, I recall, I, I'll never forget this. People, you know, Ed was the most kind-hearted individual. He was a, a fireman, a fire chief. He used to fix TVs and people would bring their TVs to Ed. And Ed <laughs> was somewhat absent-minded. <laughs> and People would say, they'd be calling him, Ed, did you fix my TV? He said, no, I'm getting to it. Ed, did you fix my TV? No, I'm getting to it. They would walk into the shop and they would see their TV with a price tag on it. <laughs> and it was it was nothing nefarious, but Ed just forgot he had their TV and he put it out on the showroom floor. Uh, does any, anyone recall his yeah. repair shop? Oh, Jim, the yeah, yeah. Jim speaking, yeah. of, speaking of Ed's uh, absent-mindedness, I don't remember if it was us or, or our neighbors had a, an issue whereby he came to the house to work on a television there at the house and fixed it, which was surprising in Ed's case, and then came back an hour or so later, knocked on the door and said he had to go in, back into the TV to get his pipe. 
that was that was Ace Anson's house. That, was it that, Ace's house? Okay. Yeah. The other funny, in line with that, so in 1965, we had a party here at Aunt Lou's and we broke our, our uh, record player. So I took it down on Monday and left it with Ed. And then n- numerous times, you know, is it ready, ready? And then forgot all about it. So then I, when I came back from college, now it's like three years later, and we were up partying again. Someone said, hey, whatever happened to the record player? And I said, you know what, I'll leave, you know, lunch at lunchtime, I'll go down and check. So I go down to Meeker's at lunchtime and there's no one in the store. So I, I go in the back where you had everything and there's the record player. And I go, great, you know, so I took it and I left the note saying I took the record player, brought it up, it still was broken. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, um... I can find, I can find a quick second if I could yeah. and talk about uh, the Washington pizza place. Um, oh great forget what year that guy 1980 81 82 you know and the controversy about the pizza place coming (laughs) into town it was going to draw bikers and you know all the other you know (laughs) and nick who's just such a you know nick uh, (laughs) and how great it was to uh, those of us who know nick and whatever and so i think we should really definitely mention you know that little business in town that his son still you know, going strong as strong as he can with his family and his kids, and and we all know um, it's one of the few film numbers that probably all of us remember to this day that we all call <laughs> <laughs> frequently is to order a pizza. Uh, and 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 it's a godsend during COVID. Uh, he was able, you were able, he was able to still get it run out to you. Uh, you could pick it up, and then they would bring it out to you. Uh, right. and, and you know, we have to say that. But going back to that thing about merchants in town and the familiarity we all have, I mean, during COVID, you ha- we have to just say every single business in town did an incredible job maintaining their activity and helping the community out and still providing their services to the community. I mean, it was a remarkable thing to see how the, the merchants and the businesses in town uh, helped to keep everybody going. and. Uh, really uh, speaks highly of us. And th- I think we also, I, I remember during the flood that uh, there was an incredible sort of energy around uh, getting things back and going and everybody in town was in the business, in the stores, mucking out the, the mud and helping them get back on their feet. Uh, and the same thing happened in that October storm that we had where the whole town was locked down for almost a week, I think, wasn't it, Jim? Absolutely, Demi. And and I would ask, and I, I don't mean to single out you and Brendan and Bruce as as uh, historians, but do, do you recall, I'm sure you guys do, what 868 meant? What was it before before it was a numerical definition? Underhill. Underhill 8. Underhill 8. Underhill 8. Yeah. Underhill. Underhill eight. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sorry. And, and New Milford was Elgin. Yeah. And, right. And, and Litchfield was Porter. Porter? Porter seven, I think. It and, was. and Woodbury was, I can't remember Woodbury. The two six. <laughs> but you needed a you needed a passport to go there. So <laughs> <laughs> same with Litchfield. <laughs> hey Demich. Hey, yeah. I don't know if you guys can read that. Yeah. <clears throat> what is it? <clears throat> I to back it up, but it's a little shot glass. Uh oh, it's empty. Yeah, it's, it's empty. The Washington liquor, and it says UN eight seven four seven one. Yeah, it's there. The, it uh, is. That's it. <laughs> yeah, Swanee. Uh, and then uh, somebody mentioned the bookstore earlier, Eric. Right? Yeah. When did your parents own the bookstore? Oh, they didn't own it. Um, oh, they just Whitney. ran it. Yeah, Tom Whitney owned it. Uh, oh, the, uh, yeah. yeah, and my father was the manager there for the uh, late 60s until he worked for the school district. Uh-huh. Um, that was uh, with with different people in there. Um, you know, it was a, I mean, it was a good bookstore. He had a lot of yeah. signings, uh, you know, from different authors coming in, a lot of great people in the area, Styron, people like that. Sure. So it was it was thriving and going. Um, yeah, and it still is. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, does, does anybody remember the two ladies who started the bookstore when it was? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Virginia Stewart is one of them. Yes. Yeah. And, and there was someone named Dickinson, and they were in the building, the Falois building that got washed down the the, the river in the yeah. flood. I see Winnie has her hand up. Do you know something about that, Winnie? No, but I, I just wanted to put a little female perspective. Um, my favorite merchant in Washington was Mrs. Davenport. Oh, her, hey. oh yeah. With her wool shop, first yeah. next to the food center, and then over next to the hickory stick. Uh, she had the most amazing patterns and could do the most amazing finishings and everything else. I think she needs a real shout out. Oh, absolutely. B. Davenport. And, and the other great. thing, yeah. the other thing I just have to mention as a kid going to the food market all the time, do you remember the placards that were up for Miss Rheingold? <laughs> I don't. <laughs> they were always wonderful. Yeah. Is, you know, my beer is Rheingold, the dry beer, <laughs> uh, yeah. all these fancy ladies were were always being um put up on on posters well they had, the, they had I, the I voting to, every year to name miss ryan yeah that's right i wanted to say something about b davenport's notion and yarn shop um i mean first of all if you didn't if you didn't have the the luxury of having met b davenport <laughs> uh that's a whole other thing but she was a wonderful warm thoughtful lady and as a child, um, I would very often go into B. Davenport's uh, because I'm not missing, yeah, I guess even as a child, and I would buy my mother nylons for her birthday. Uh -huh. B. Davenport knew my mother's nylon size, so I always ended up with the right nylons. Why I felt that I should buy my mother nylons, I'm not sure, but... <laughs> That was just a thing. And I would go into bees and she'd say, oh, it's time for the nylons. And she'd give me a pair of nylons. She knew what my mother wore and everything. Uh, and um, there was another little store in town. Uh, there was a hobby shop that the Stonalls uh, mm -hmm. ran. Yeah. And uh, I, I, of course, was a trained hobbyist and model maker as a kid. And they had all those models in there. But the Stonalls were also a photography shop, I think. Yes. And, yeah. Right. That, that was right across from Randy's. Yeah, yeah. exactly. It was it was um, sort of in one. It's where that brick building is now. The uh, I think there's a dog grooming service in there or something. Yeah. Um, he took he took all the pictures for the yearbook. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and next to the Stonehalls was Cummings Jewelry Store. Yeah. Nelson Cummings, yeah. Nelson yeah, Cummings. Yeah, that was later. Yeah, that was later. Uh, before that was was Sophie's. Uh, what was Sophie's clothing store called? Does anybody remember? Well, it it ended up in my building, the Hickory Stick building, yep. and it had a queue in it, and then Edna Quist bought it from her, and from then Sophie. the Whitney's. The, yeah, and then the Whitney's ended up buying it, and they tore down the walls to expand yeah. the the Hickory Stick. Yeah. Well, Edna Quist had a children's clothing store. Yeah, well, she that was in Sophie. She, she right. took over Sophie Hollister's shop and turned it into a children's store. Mm -hmm. That's where mm -hmm. she was in my in the my building there. Yeah, Is anybody, Dimitri, uh, can I just have the yeah. floor again? So I, I'm going to just shift gears of one block over. So if you, if you, um, well, actually, ask you to up the street where today's restaurant uh, started which was the Cook Sisters uh, house. And then a couple of guys from the city came up and uh, they turned that residence into what was today's restaurant, right. which mm. is, I don't know how many, I don't know how many other owners, but it's today it's GW Tavern. That's right. Uh, and Vincent, then further yeah. down was the oh. watering hole of watering holes, which uh, uh -huh. been years. <laughs> the Spog Club. Club. But, yeah. But anyway, yeah, and across from that is Anderson's Cleaners right. and Anderson's exactly. Rug Mart. Yes, exactly. Uh, yep, yep. Uh, and that's still a, a going, a going concern as well. And and yep. Vincent, I saw you gesturing. Do you, do you have something you wanted to offer? Uh, not to offer, actually, to ask. And you guys are right on the right track. I was going to ask about businesses on B Brook. Uh, I know I've heard about Chatfield's Lumber and there's some gas stations. I don't know if that was 
just before the flood or many years before? I mean, yeah, I think it was. Gunnarsson's I, was up there. That was after the flood, though. After. Yeah. Looks so, like this is up in Preston Station. Came after the flood. Okay, so like Chatfield's lumber was that? From what I understand, is where the fire department is now. In that area. Yes. So where Distinctive Pool is, what what was that whole area where Chris Collins' houses and all that are? Were those all just all residential houses that were moved after the flood? Yeah, most of them were on the riverside of Bee Brook and were moved uh, back over. Uh, at least as, as far as I know, most of them were moved back from the riverside. Uh, some of them may have been originally on that side. And then further down, uh, the um, I think the Wyants built the building where Hidden Valley is and uh, uh, whatever that uh, business is now. Um, I think the Wyants built that building. And then later, further down where the Erickson uh, donated their building for the ambulance, which thank you very yeah. much. Uh, I don't think they exactly donated it, but uh, I think they helped us get the ambulance in there. Uh, that building was Tulip Tree. Was Tulip Tree the original building? No, that? Oh, no. That, was, that was Shaughness. Shaughness, Shaughness was had a, a furniture right. place yeah. there. And, and, was and the house next to it was where they lived. And, and the Shaughnessy's, right? Shaughness. S, no, S-J-O-N-O-S-T. Shaughness. Uh -huh. right. So that was a <laughs> furniture shop. Where, where Wyatt and Company is, is uh, uh, that was Gunnarsson's building first. Yeah. Oh, and right. Wyatt's added on to the front of it, but the, the garage was back there originally. And what my wife was asking about the pool company, when I was a kid, that was a lawnmower repair shop. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Carlson. And, and, and wasn't the house just to the right of the pool company as you're facing it? Wasn't that where Link Fenn lived? Correct. Uh, he was down. he was right down on the, on the corner. He was the law, yeah. The law, yeah. Link, yeah. Link Finn lived on the corner because you came around the, uh, you come across the yeah. old railroad tracks. Well, that's yeah, my dangerous. brother and I went over there to swing on his swings one day, and you know how you get those tripod swings, get them going real high, and we tipped it over, and well we done. like hell because we were afraid of Link coming out of the house. We never saw before, him. Before we end up here tonight, I want to make sure we pay some attention to some of the places we've not gotten to, which, first of all, New Preston. Uh, no. I wanted to mention Crassel's store. And um, uh, I, I mean, going to Crassel's from walking down from the lake to get a fudgesicle at Crassel's and having it melt on your arm all the way back up to the lake. Uh, and then... Um, of course, uh, Dowler's was uh, where um, the, um, uh, what's his name, clothing store is now. And, Z um, and Zinix, were Zinix the, the food market? Well, Zinix, that, was where, that was where Don Hill Antiques is. Yeah. yeah and, that, and it wasn't called Zinix. Its name was Kelly's Store. But uh -huh. everybody uh -huh. called it Zinix. <laughs> no, it wasn't Kelly's, Bill. That was, uh, it was owned by Kelly's brother. We lived in Preston in 1962, and it, 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 it its real name was Kelly's Store, but everybody called it Zinix. Right. Uh, and, and don't forget a few others. Connected to Zinix Store was the New Preston Post Office yeah, for right. a long time. Mm -hmm. And you just walked through Zinix into the post office. Yeah. Right. And at one point, Gene Wright Nelson was the postmistress there until they decided to shut the whole thing down. Yeah, you've, right. also got, you've also got the liquor store run by Jessens. You've All also right. got Mika's Electric, which is run up next to Dowler's. You've also got the New Preston branch of the Washington Supply, which was substantial, big yeah. building. Next to them was Rocco's, who was a barber uh, right. in New Preston. And next to that was a fellow, Don Simpson, who ran a sewing machine business for a number of years. Nice. And then, of course, Crasselts. So, and wasn't the there a Stopler's drugstore in there? Yeah, Stopler's yeah. drugstore was in there, run by Honey Stopler. Honey yeah. Father. 
that's a new Preston that's no, as we all know, no longer there. It's, um, I can remember at one point, I've said this before, Henry Van Sinderen wanted to demolish New Preston and move everything down to 202. And needless to say, the fur was flying. Yeah. Um, but that was a, a big move to bring upgrade New Preston comparable to Washington. Yeah. Well, he, he yeah. actually had a plan. He bought a lot of the property between, you know, coming up the hill and he owned the, the you know, the, where the town beach is now. And he right. wanted to create a Sturbridge village thing and the people just were against uh -huh. it. I remember, I oh. represent New Preston. He finally gave up and gave the parcels that he bought to the New Preston Women's Club. And I yeah. represented them when they sold them, you know, to raise some money. But he did plan, if you look at the first plan of development, which came out in 1962, there was going to be a sewage treatment plant right down on 202 below yeah. the falls. You know, so. Well, well, wasn't there a, a, just a bar, <coughs> there me, a just bar restaurant where the town beach is now? Yeah, yeah. The, it, the, it, the log it, cabin. Yeah, yeah, the log cabin, yeah. Well, yeah, I just wanted to mention something here. That was called the Lakeshore, well, too. Yeah, yeah in the Lakeshore. Lake yeah. uh, I just wanted to mention that what we've just gone through is this incredible sort of thing where you realize how many individual small businesses each of these areas of the town had. We didn't get to Woodville, we didn't get to uh, Marbledale, uh, but there was a point in which when you drove through town as Brendan just did, there were dozens of small businesses where you could get anything you wanted and if you didn't like what was in one store the chances are there was another store that had it and uh whether it was new preston or marvelldale or woodville even had a little bit of business uh and certainly the town of washington and at some points in the in the past the washington green also was a commercial center it wasn't just a residential uh architectural edifice so uh we have to remember that part of what makes a community so vital is when you have that much entrepreneurship and that much ownership that gives back to the community this kind of service. And I think we didn't even touch the subject. I mean, I think we'll probably need to do this some more, but we, I think for those of you who didn't know some of the people we were talking about, the one thing that you can take away from this conversation is that there was an incredible personal relationship with all of these businesses. And even today, that relationship continues with the businesses that are in. And part of having a business in Washington is that personal contact with the community. And we're very lucky to have that. Uh, is there anybody who wanted to say anything more before we, uh, I think we're close to over our hour. Jimmy, can I just, just, just one quick story yeah. that illustrates yeah. exactly what you just said. Uh, when my father died in 1967, the first person that showed up at our door on Wickham Road was Bill Williams from the Chapog Club. Yeah. Um, we were just gonna bring up the Chapog Club. And, and um, <laughs> with, with a, a, a turkey and all the dressings and a meal, everything you could possibly want to, to live for two or three days as a, as a young family who just lost their their dad and husband. So right. that's a good example of what you just described. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah, you didn't, we Was still didn't even touch any of the businesses around the riverside. Oh, 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 yeah, go ahead. We have, there was a lot of businesses on the riverside and the river road across from the big store. They were all like all those, like Adam and Peterson and all those. Hi, buddy. Yeah, all along, all along what we now call River Road was Main Street. Gopher's uh, Pharmacy. Yeah. Uh, Otto Renz Beauty Shop, Louis the Barber. Yeah. Uh, there was a whole bunch of elect the electrical shops. That's true. And I think a lot of people don't realize that when they drive down River Road, that wasn't a park. That was called Main Street. And the reason it was called Main Street was because the majority of businesses ran along that road. And uh, the center of town was basically that road, that, that road, Main Street, and there were a half a dozen businesses along that. The center where the Randy store is now, uh, we noted the supply company and the railroad tracks went right through the center of town. So 
our vaunted town hall uh, lawn at one point was a stockyard. So uh, it's good to know that uh, this town has uh, continued to evolve from all of those periods, but we shouldn't forget what a rich history that gave us. And uh, people that like the women who started the um, uh, bookstore, uh, women like B. Davenport and Sophie who had their own businesses and other uh, characters in town, we had a rich history. And I appreciate all of you helping us to try to remember. And I think we owe it to ourselves to do this again. And I hope some of you will take some notes and some stories and we'll try to organize ourselves in a different way so that you have more opportunity to tell some of your recollections of your encounters. Uh, Stephen, are you, are you out there somewhere? Yep, I'm here. Uh, is there anything else we need to cover, Stephen? No. Leone. Don't forget Leone's. Oh, Leone's. Oh, yeah. oh my God. I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have shoes if it wasn't for Leone's. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I just want to thank everyone quickly. I'm, I grew up and I live in Harwinton. But a year ago, I recently took over as owner of the pantry. And hey, the congratulations! Depot. Doing so great, by the way. It's really nice to hear all the the history behind it. I uh, I work with a Miss Shirley Downs, who's famous oh, yeah. in town. So I always hear all the history stories from her, and she tells me about the railroad and everything else. And they're always great stories. So I'm I'm looking forward to learning more about the town. Well, we congratulate you on taking over the pantry because it, it's a much loved institution here. Thank you. Thank you. And you're Dimitri, doing great. Dimitri, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Dimitri plugs you all the time. <laughs> Thanks, Dimitri. Best advertising. Yep. <laughs> pantry up. <laughs> thank you. Well, I think that I think that does it for us this evening. And we're going to I'm going to talk with Stephen about a way to do this. Uh, so that we can have people gather in the next time, hopefully, and uh, we can do this as a hybrid meeting between so the people that can actually be in the same room together and we can all tell our stories at the top of our lungs. Thank you. All right. Thank you all. It's great thank to you. see you and thank you for your participation. Really appreciate it. Thanks. <clears throat>